So we're going to talk about testing for autocorrelation in regression error terms. Let's start out considering a regression model. So this is going to be quite standard, dependent variable yt, a constant, and an explanatory variable xt and a coefficient beta, and an error term ut. So we call that equation 1. This error term ut, this is an unobserved error term, but it will be potentially autocorrelated, and this is what we will be testing for. We're going to start by estimating this model by OLS, and we will obtain the estimated residuals ut hat, and we will get those for capital T observations. And we shall plot them. So here I have an example, some regression for which I calculated the error terms and I plot them along a time axis. If there was no autocorrelation, that would imply that these error terms are independent. Okay, So we would expect this graph to show no dependence from one error term to the next. They should look random. So independence is our null will turn out to be our null hypothesis, the absence of autocorrelation. However, when we look at this graph, we can clearly identify what we could call runs of data. Okay? What do we mean with runs of data? If you look at that graph, these error terms will average around zero. But we can see occasions or time periods where all error terms are above zero. And then other time periods where a cluster of error terms is below zero. So this is what we call runs of data. And we wouldn't expect that if the error terms were independent. So clearly the graphical inspection here already yields the result. Autocorrelation in this particular example seems to be a problem. However, graphical inspection will not always yield such a clear result. And what we are really after is a formal way of testing for autocorrelation. And I will, in this clip, talk about two different procedures. The first one is what is called the Durbin-Watson statistic. It will, however, turn out that this will not be useful as a formal testing procedure. The second is what is called the Preuss Godfrey test or LM test. And this is the go to test we will use to test for autocorrelation. So let's first talk about the Durbin Watson test statistic. We'll start by calculating the first order autocorrelation for the estimated residual. So the correlation between ut hat and ut hat minus 1. We call that rho hat. Then we calculate the dv statistic, which is 2 times 1 minus rho hat. So let's think about the extreme cases of perfect autocorrelation rho hat equals 1. That will deliver Durbin-Watson test of 0. Perfect negative correlation will deliver Durbin-Watson stat of 4. And no autocorrelation will deliver one of 2. So anything between 0 and 2 is in the region of positive autocorrelation. And anything between 2 and 4 for the Durbin-Watson stat is, indicates negative autocorrelation. In our particular example, of which we saw the graph earlier, we get the Durbin-Watson test statistic of 0.39. So that lies in the area of positive autocorrelation. The Durbin-Watson test is usually reported in all standard regression outputs of most statistical packages. And that is why I want you to know how it is being calculated. However, it's not useful as a formal test for autocorrelation, and there are three reasons for that. Firstly, the actual distribution of the Durbin-Watson test statistic is quite complicated and makes formal hypothesis testing quite difficult, for which we need the distribution under the null of no autocorrelation. The second reason is that rho hat is potentially inconsistently estimated. So even for very large sample sizes, we may not be approaching the true first order autocorrelation. And the last reason is that it really only allows for autocorrelation of order one. And that is quite restrictive. 
especially if you have seasonal data, you would want to also consider higher order autocorrelations. Let's pose a question with respect to Durbin Watson statistics. Assume you run a regression and obtain a Durbin Watson statistic of 1.84. What does this imply in terms of autocorrelation? Here are five possible answers. First, this is an indication of a negative autocorrelation. Second, as this value is smaller than 2, there is no significant autocorrelation. Statistically significant autocorrelation. Or 3, this indicates mild positive autocorrelation. 4, as this value is much larger than 0, this indicates strong autocorrelation. Strong positive autocorrelation. And lastly, one really shouldn't uh, look at the Durban Watson statistic. One should disregard this. So pause the clip and think. Before we evaluate whether each of these answers is correct or not, let's recall the mechanics of the Durban Watson stat. It could take values between 0 and 4. Okay, and in between, of course, in the middle is 2. Now, what did this represent? The value of 0 was associated to an autocorrelation coefficient, first order autocorrelation coefficient of the error terms of 1. Value of 4 was associated to perfect negative autocorrelation, and 2 was associated to 0. So values between 0 and 2 represent positive autocorrelation, between 2 and 4, negative autocorrelation. So with that knowledge, we can clearly see that the value of 1.84 is in the positive autocorrelation range. So the first answer um, is clearly incorrect. Now the second one, uh, whether the value is smaller than 2 really has nothing to do with statistical significance. That's like you were possibly thinking of t-tests if you answer that. The third one, mild positive autocorrelation, I think that's exactly right. So it's just smaller than 2, it's in a positive range, but not very deeply in the positive range. So mild positive autocorrelation is possibly a pretty good guess here. Now, as this value is larger than 0, it indicates strong positive autocorrelation. That's, that's not the case. Actually, 0 would be the strongest indication of positive autocorrelation. And lastly, should one disregard it? Well, that's one view, but we can learn something from it. We have learned that there's mild positive autocorrelation, so one shouldn't disregard it, but one has to be realistic or precise of what we can actually learn from it. So let's talk about the proish free test or Lacroche multiplier test. This is the real test we want to use, and it uses an auxiliary regression approach. But let's start with the original regression model again. Yt is alpha plus xt beta plus ut, the error terms. Now importantly that xt, this could now be a vector. Right? If that's a vector, then the beta will be a vector of the corresponding size. And importantly, as we're dealing with time series data, it may contain lagged variables. That may be lagged versions of explanatory variables or even lagged uh, versions of yt, so yt minus 1, yt minus 2, and so forth. So the first step in our testing procedure is that we estimate this model by OLS, okay, using ordinary least squares. That's the first step. The second is that we obtain the residuals, ut hat, at standard procedure after estimating an, an OLS regression. Third, we run an auxiliary regression dependent variable are exactly these error terms, the estimated residuals, ut hat. And then since we are testing for autocorrelation, we're putting on the right hand side lagged versions of ut hat. So u, u hat t minus 1, u hat t minus 2, up to u hat t minus k. Right? These are now explanatory variable. I'll talk later about the k, what that is. And there will be a new error term, let's call it vt. Now, whenever we run an auxiliary regression with the estimated residuals as the dependent variable, we will also have to include on the left-hand side, and that's why you can see that 
uh, gap, we will also have to include the explanatory variables from the original model. So that's a constant and xt with different parameter values. They always have to appear whenever we run an auxiliary regression with ut hat as the dependent variable. Now, of course, we know that this part of the explanatory variables, that constant plus the xt, will be uncorrelated to the ut hat. And we know that because it's a property of the OLS residuals that they are uncorrelated with the explanatory variables used in the model from which we get the residuals. Right? It's an OLS residuals property. They are uncorrelated to the UT hat. So they will not contribute to anything. It's that part, that red bit here, and its relationship to UT hat that determines whether this auxiliary regression will deliver an R squared larger than zero. So if there's no autocorrelation, then the red part will have no impact on UT hat. Then lagged values of UT hat will not explain any variation in ut hat okay and what that means or what that implies is that all these coefficients row one row two all the way to row k will be equal to zero and the r squared from this auxiliary regression will be equal to zero as well if however there is autocorrelation then we will find that these lagged values of ut hat will explain variation in ut hat and that will then deliver an r squared from this auxiliary regression that is larger than zero and it also means that at least one of these row coefficients will have to be unequal to zero right? and therefore a large r squared larger than zero so now we need to formally test whether there is autocorrelation. So as null hypothesis, we will take this part up here. Right? So the null hypothesis is that all these row coefficients will be equal to zero. And that implies no autocorrelation. The alternative will be that at least one is unequal to zero and that corresponds to autocorrelated error terms. So that's this, this part here. Okay. So that's the alternative hypothesis. What's the test statistic? It's our usual test statistic when we're using auxiliary regression n times r squared, and it's chi squared distributed with k degrees of freedom, where that k corresponds to the number of restrictions we have imposed. Again, the number of restrictions we can see from the null hypothesis, k coefficients are restricted to zero in the null. Now graphically, a chi-square distribution looks a little bit like this. It actually looks a little bit like an f-statistic. It only lives on the positive line because r-squared is always positive and therefore n times r-squared. And what we now need, it's going to be a right tail test because we will be rejecting a h naught for large r-squareds. What we need is a critical value that cuts off alpha of the probability and we will reject h naught if the LM test is larger than the critical value. So we have a rejection region and a region in which we do not reject H0. Now just an explanation to this n times r squared. It's as before, these, the n and the r squared come from the auxiliary regression when we used auxiliary regressions before. That's the number of observations in the auxiliary regression, the n. We've got to be careful when we're doing autocorrelation testing. Remember our original model, we said we have capital T observations. Now since we included T lag, so we got capital T values of ut hat but we included k lags, that means we are losing k observations. So n is t minus k. And the r squared comes from the auxiliary regression. Just a note before we complete this here. What k should you be choosing? Well, that depends a little bit on the frequency of your data. So if you have quarterly data, you want to may want to allow for quarterly autocorrelation. So k would be at least 4 or perhaps 8, a multiple of 4. If you have monthly observations, use 12. So let's pose a question with respect to the Proj Godfrey test. We'll assume you performed a Proj 
Gottfried Tesseler cross multiply a test for autocorrelation of up to order three. So we included three lags in the auxiliary regression. And you obtained an R squared in that auxiliary regression of 0 0.023. The original regression model, so that was in step one of our procedure, had 100 observations. So now the question is, is autocorrelation a problem? Pause the clip and try and solve the question. So here is the solution. First, we state the null and the alternative hypothesis. I'll do that short here. Say H0 is no autocorrelation. HA is autocorrelation. The test statistic we shall use is the LM test n times R squared from the auxiliary regression with three lags included. So therefore the distribution is chi squared with three degrees of freedom. We shall set a significance level of 5% and then we can formulate the decision rule reject H0 if the LM test is larger than and we need a critical value. So here we have a little bit of the chi squared table. Three degrees of freedom, five uh, percent significance level 7.8147 it's the critical value so let's draw a little picture our critical value is here 7.8 to the right we have five percent of the probability mass and now we just need our test statistic n that's going to be t 100 minus 3 minus 3 included lags so 97 times 0 0.023 is 2.231 that's about here to the left of the critical value, we will not reject the null hypothesis. There is no problem with autocorrelation in this particular data set.